Hello! Nine out of ten veterinary surgeons thought that Theo had effusive FIP. Do you agree with them? This film is a case study for veterinary surgeons and veterinary students. Theo was a six-month-old Bengal cross tabby cat who presented to his primary veterinary surgeon in June 2021 with severe abdominal enlargement which was due to ascites. Theo was presented to me in July 2021 because he had been on oral GS441524 treatment for three weeks, but his effusion was getting worse instead of better. And I'd like to just say a big shout out to Lata from Mutian for spotting that there was something wrong and referring Theo to me. Was his FIP treatment not working? Why was his FIP treatment not working? There were three possible explanations. First, he didn't really have FIP. Second, the coronavirus infecting him was resistant to the anti-coronavirus drug being used. Or third, he had a second condition in addition to FIP, giving the impression that his FIP wasn't responding to treatment. Diane's first rule of FIP treatment is always check the FIP diagnosis. So that is what we'll do now. You might like to pause this video so that you can download the FIP diagnosis algorithm to follow along during the video. To download the flowchart, go to www.catvirus.com. Select the Downloads and eBooks tab on the left, then the Free Downloads, then the FIP Diagnosis flowchart. It is available in about a dozen languages now, but the English one is always the most up to date. You will download a four page PDF with algorithms for diagnosing effusive and non effusive FIP, feline coronavirus diarrhea, and the fourth page is a flowchart for interpreting feline coronavirus, RT-PCR and antibody test results. Step 1 of the FIP diagnostic algorithm is about the cat's history. Let us begin by zooming in on the table on the right. This table gives us a rough probability of a cat having FIP based on age and breed. We go back to his presentation. Theo was a six-month-old Bengal cross tabby. OK, so his breed is between both columns. He's neither a pure pedigree, but he's not exactly a moggy either. So we'll circle both boxes. He was under one year old, therefore the chance that his ascites is due to FIP is very high, between 79 and 95%. Now the reason for taking a careful history is that for a cat to develop FIP, he or she must have had a chance to become infected with feline coronavirus. Feline coronavirus infection is most prevalent in multi-cat indoor environments, such as cat breeders and rescue shelters. Therefore, it is important to discover where the cat came from and how long ago. The incubation period for effusive FIP is usually weeks to months, and a non-effusive FIP tends to be longer. But by 18 months after infection, the chance of FIP reduces to just 4%. Theo was bought from a person claiming to be a cat breeder, so we put a tick for the first question. The second question is related and we can't comment. The third question is age and he was only six months old, so we put a tick here. The fourth question is about stress. He had received his second vaccine mid-April, so yes, that was a stress. We'll tick that box. Step two is the clinical examination. As we've already seen, Theo was grossly ascitic. This was confirmed by ultrasound. However, he was bright and active, and this can be the case in effusive FIP, whereas in non-effusive FIP, the cat is typically dull and inappetent. The attending clinician noted that Theo was thin, despite the huge abdomen. His veterinary notes did not record whether or not he was pyrexic. Moving on to step three, this is an examination of the effusion usually performed in-house. Let us zoom in on this box. An effusion sample was taken and it was serosanguinous in appearance, which is consistent with FIP, so we'll put a tick there. The other measures were not performed except the Revalta test, which was positive, so that gets a tick too. I would urge you to watch my video about the Revalta test if you haven't already done so. It should be mainly used to rule out FIP, but never to make a firm diagnosis of FIP. The predictive value positive of a Revalta test is only 58%, which is just a little bit over chance. 
I will put a link to the Rivalta film in the notes of those platforms which allowed notes. The effusion sample was sent off for feline coronavirus RT-PCR testing, which is step four of the algorithm. And here is where the big surprise came. The result was negative. So what does the algorithm say when we have a negative RT-PCR? It says the predictive value of a negative FECOV RT-PCR on an effusion depends entirely on the sensitivity of the test being used. Well, the laboratory which tested the effusion was IDEX UK, which is a well-established laboratory. There was no real reason to doubt this result. Nevertheless, on the basis of what we have seen so far, especially the Rivalta test, the vets diagnosed FIP and the CATS guardians set about doing everything they could to save Theo. They purchased Mutian pills, which have an excellent track record for curing FIP. Three weeks after starting Mutine, Theo was no better. His attending vets were pushing for euthanasia, but his guardians wanted a second opinion, and the people at Mutian recommended they consult me. Reading Theo's history and laboratory results, I was struck by several things that I would not expect in a case of FIP. The first, obviously, was the lack of response to Mutian. I have never known a cat with FIP to not recover rapidly when on Mutian pills. Second was that his globulins hadn't increased in the two times they were tested, and they were rather low at 28 and 27 grams per litre. The normal is under 45 grams per litre. Cats with FIP usually have hyperglobulinemia. The third, obviously, was the negative coronavirus RT-PCR on the effusion. Meanwhile, Theo's guardians changed their primary veterinary surgery as well. Fikov RT-PCR on ascites was repeated and once again was found to be negative. In spite of this, the new vets were insisting that Theo had FIP and they recommended euthanasia. Theo saw nine vets who said he had FIP and recommended euthanasia. Fortunately for Theo, his guardians did not comply. My recommendation was for a feline coronavirus antibody test, so a blood sample was sent to Glasgow Veterinary School Laboratory. His feline coronavirus antibody titer was zero. He had not been exposed recently to feline coronavirus. Nine veterinary surgeons at three different practices said that Theo had FIP. Would you have diagnosed him with FIP based on his clinical signs and a positive Rivalta test in spite of the negative RT-PCR result? The double negative results convinced me that Theo did not have FIP. However, his alpha-1 acid glycoprotein, AGP, level was raised, indicating infection or inflammation. And the ultrasound examinations had shown abdominal masses. I recommended an exploratory laparotomy, but the vets were insistent that this would be cruel. He had FIP and should be humanely put to sleep. By now, Theo was going downhill fast. We had to do something. Eventually, I wrote a stiff letter to the attending vets insisting that Theo be given a chance and have the operation. But of course, I had doubts. Suppose I was wrong. So many other vets were sure this was FIP. Theo was hospitalised and two litres of abdominal effusion were drained over a period of three days. Then he was operated on and the spleen with its mass were removed and sent for histopathology. His ascites had been caused by an abscess on the spleen. The effusion was sent for bacterial culture and antibiotic sensitivity. An unusual bacterium called Pseudomonas was isolated. Theo was treated with antibiotics and put into a cone to protect his stitches. Here is Theo looking very happy to be home from the veterinary surgery and enjoying a well-earned rest. This photo shows how bright and interested he was after his operation. Here is Theo cuddling up with his girlfriend after the stitches were taken out. Theo is alive and well six months on. There are lessons we can learn from Theo's case. First, a positive Rivalta test is not diagnostic of FIP. Rivalta tests should be mainly used to exclude a diagnosis of FIP. Second, a sensitive, accurate feline coronavirus antibody test would have saved Theo's guardians, a young couple, 
over £5,000. More importantly, a feline coronavirus antibody test would have saved this cat weeks of suffering. If Theo had belonged to anybody but Callum and Lily, it is likely that the FIP misdiagnosis would have cost him his life. Most of those nine vets wanted to euthanize him. The vets told Theo's guardian that they didn't trust the feline coronavirus RT-PCR results. I think this case shows the importance of using laboratories and tests that you can rely upon. Tests with good specificity and sensitivity, especially sensitivity in this case. No comparative survey of available feline coronavirus RT-PCR tests has been published. However, in 2015, I published in the Journal of Feline Medicine and Surgery an independent assessment of feline coronavirus antibody tests, and the results were surprising. For a screening test to see if FIP should be on your list of differential diagnoses, you want to test with excellent sensitivity. This is a table from our JFIMS paper. The first row has the name of the tests that were compared, in fact, other tests were also compared, but the manufacturers were given the option to decline publication if they wished. The second row is the row of sensitivity results. You can see that these tests all had very high sensitivity, and these three tests had outstanding sensitivity. Let's do a short reminder about laboratory tests. Imagine you do a feline coronavirus antibody test using a feline coronavirus immunocomb and you will get a positive or negative result. So you get a negative result and then you might ask yourself, is this a true negative or a false negative? If you don't believe the result, the obvious thing to do is another test using a different brand of test or a different laboratory. Twice Theo's feline coronavirus RT-PCR results came back negative and yet the vets still didn't believe the results, although it is incredibly rare for an effusive FIP case not to have viral RNA in the effusion. You need a test with excellent sensitivity to rule out FIP with absolute confidence. Note that step three of the FIP diagnostic algorithm specifies that the feline coronavirus antibody test should be performed on blood, not on effusion. This is because it's possible for there to be so much virus in the effusion that it blocks all the antibodies, preventing them from sticking to viral antigen in the test. And this can give a false negative result, especially on tests that aren't very sensitive to begin with. This is a cartoon of how we believe false negative results happen. A drop of effusion full of virus, represented by these little green things, is being put onto to a rapid immunodiffusion test or immunomigration test. But the antibodies, represented by the little Y-shaped things, are all attached to the virus in the effusion. Therefore, they are unavailable to bind to the virus in the test, resulting in a false negative result. A reminder of term definitions. Sensitivity is the ability to detect a small amount of something, Specificity is the ability to detect something correctly. A false positive result can be disastrous, especially in a condition like FIP, where some cats will be euthanized if diagnosed with FIP. If you enjoyed this video, you might like some of my other videos, such as Does Pancho Have FIP? Does Tommy Have FIP? And Does Basil Have FIP? This video is part of a series on FIP treatments not working or FIP relapses and is part of a playlist called Rules for Preventing FIP Relapses. Obviously, this film is an example of Rule 1. Make sure the FIP diagnosis is correct. As Professor Mike Willard once said, a wrong diagnosis can be far more devastating than no diagnosis and this case report was a good example of that. Please subscribe to my channel and press the notification button to be alerted of other videos in this series. Please consider becoming a sponsor to help me make more films like this. Many, many thanks to Callum and Lily for photography and for allowing Theo's story to be used in this film. Huge thanks to the catvirus.com subscribers and donors for sponsoring this film. Thank you for watching this video. God bless you and your cats.
This is Diane Addy, praying for an end to all animal suffering, especially in factory farms. And here is Theo waving goodbye.